a little over 616,000 square feet of space was actually analyzed. At each of the locations, just to give you a sense of the methodology, we measured out a 300 foot area, 15 feet wide. And in that area, we counted what's called visible litter. And that is anything that's over four inches in size. It's the, it's the litter that you are more likely to see as you're driving down the roadway. But in order to get a really uh, accurate or more accurate representation of what's on the roadways, we also in a 15 by 15 area at the beginning, middle and end of each of those sites, we did um, what is called a, a, an analysis of micro litter. So those were all the objects that we found that were under four inches inside. And we went through a process at each of the sites as well of trying to determine what the causes were of the litter. Where did the litter generate from? Was it intentional? Was it unintentional? We also documented what the material was made out of uh, as packaging material, obviously the specific item itself. And then we also categorized it into different groups that we'll share with you. It's available in the downloads as um, Susan was mentioning. And finally, we did site conditions. So we looked to see if there were any factors that might impact the litter in that area, um, pre predominantly looking at what were the adjacent land uses, what were the road conditions and impacts, what were the infrastructure. What we found was an astonishing 143.8 million pieces of litter across the roadways in Louisiana. And this is a picture of some of that, that litter was accumulated on the side. But as you can see, there's lots of different types of pieces. So I mentioned categories, items, and materials. Well, this gives you that deeper dive into what we actually uh, classified. So <clears throat> our categories, as you can see, were on the far left. And then for each of those categories, then we went into what was the particular item also that we found. So sometimes we found the item and then cross-checked it back to a category. And then we also noted what type of material it was. So this represents basically all of the different materials that we found, the type of packaging that it was in, that's the material category, the specific item itself, and then that category. So. Uh, just as um, an example, um, <clears throat> we looked at, uh, for example, in fast foods, we were looking at boxes and clamshells, but also trays, uh, small paper boats, uh, plates, utensils, uh, napkins. It was sort of like, typically you can tell that that's coming from a fast food restaurant. Uh, and that was then identified by those material types. If we could tell that it was identified you know, possibly by something that you would purchase from the grocery store, we would classify that um, in um, home food containers, but mainly that was in those fast food categories. So this is by that category, the aggregate of what we what we found. So looking at that, that column of uh, materials, um, the breakdown was uh, primarily in the state of Louisiana. Um, there are issues around smoking because the highest amount was tobacco products. It was found on the side of the road. So tobacco products included, as you may have seen on that previous slide, it's the boxes, the wrappers, the butts, uh, the cigar tips. It's all of those pieces that make up those products. Um, the second largest amount was beverage containers. So the, anything that a beverage could be consumed in, a bottle, a can, that's the second category. And then uh, very closely uh, construction debris, which is higher than what we've found in other states. Um, we think that has a great deal to do with um, the proximity and time to the hurricanes um, that had a, that occur in the state of Louisiana. And that also during the time that we were there, uh, there were some severe weather conditions that may have impacted it. But we think it was more related to uh, the recovery from the, the hurricanes from 2021 and before. And cups and lids, uh, primarily those are items from fast foods um, were that, that next category along with fast foods. 
in the packaging material, uh, probably not surprising to most that hear the news on a regular basis about litter is that plastic was the largest packaging material type with well, over 43%. Um, and that included uh, the, the plastic bottles, um, which were found in over 80% of the sites that we surveyed, uh, but it would also include uh, the, the packaging materials from not only quick serve items, but um, any items um, that were like single use uh, that people may not uh, have a, have a connection to and discard those um, either intentionally or unintentionally on a regular basis um, on a higher, a higher level. And tobacco related, we grouped together uh, at 24.5% because the tobacco products have multiple layers in most cases. A cigarette butt is actually a composition of, of things that are, or, are plastic, paper, organics. So we classified those tobacco products into uh, the second highest category, uh, which is 24.5%. And then you'll see at um, much smaller levels, uh, the metal and paper products. Um, metal was primarily um, aluminum beverage cans uh, and paper was um, a variety of different paper types, but probably the highest among those were paper products from fast food or quick service restaurants. As we look next at the aggregate litter, and aggregate litter is both that large and small litter, so everything over four inches um, as well as under four inches, uh, we wanted to, to look at the plastics itself. So as I said, this was the largest um, item that we found. So we wanted to dive a little bit deeper into what actually was the composition within those plastic items. And the largest percentage um, at 15.3% was plastic beverage containers uh, and uh, caps. Um, so the, the bottles, soft drink bottles, uh, water bottles, those would, would all fall within uh, that category. It's only slightly behind cups and lids. So all beverage drinking related. Uh, because we were along roadways, um, this is something both to think about from a standpoint of messaging, because um, we're you know, identifying that people are consuming beverages while driving down the roadways. So for 31% of that plastic, that's where that's generated. So uh, within that plastic category, this is a big group. So if we want to try to reduce the amount of plastic on the roadways, then you know, how can we message uh, potentially using that as a, as a campaigning message about those beverage containers, keeping them in the car, making sure that you get them to the proper disposal location. Don't let them blow out of the back of the truck or drop them uh, out the window, as the case may be. So that's a, that's a real opportunity. The next one with the polystyrene containers, food services, that makes up between the two of those about 21%. And again, something that those polystyrene containers probably, we would estimate that that over 90% of those would have come potentially from some type of quick food um, service um, and also from, um, from foam from uh, ice chest uh, was something that we that we found. So again, an opportunity for for messaging within the food industry, uh, within the takeout industry, trying to think about how we can prevent that litter uh, from happening. So let's get a little bit more granular and look specifically at what the items were that we found uh, as the the project team was walking along the sides of the road, we identified 93 different types of visible litter. Um, of that litter, 45% uh, of the visible uh, litter was made up of these top 10 items. So this really does represent the substantial part of what we found um, on the side of the roads. Um, as I mentioned uh, uh, earlier, water bottles were the most prevalent, found at over 80% of the sites. They just slightly were above that of 
uh, beer containers um, made out of metal and, and aluminum. Uh, aluminum specifically is that metal type of, of product. Uh, consistent with that beverage container being very high, the next highest item you'll see there on the list um, is the, the cup lids. Uh, but as you look down this li list, you'll see that, that many of these items, um, with the exception of the tire debris, probably generated from uh, a convenience store, a quick service stop, um, a, um, a fast food restaurant. Um, which makes an opportunity for us to, again, think about how uh, messaging might be done, um, how local uh, programs might be done, uh, partnering with uh, the, the locations that, that sell these products, so point of sales, the possibility of being able to uh, really help to address the large, larger litter, the visible litter. Cecile, I'm going to jump in. Um, this full list can be found on our website in the report. Is that correct? These, this is just the top 10, but if you're interested in the full listing, it is in the complete report. That's correct. All 96 items, uh, the number and percentages of each of those that we found is located in the appendix. And I just wanted for our attendees, uh, the chat is disabled, so please uh, put your questions in the Q&A section down below and we'll monitor it. Thank you. So similar to uh, the visible litter is the micro litter. So four inches or less, what did we find? 68 different types of micro litter. Um, so in this particular category, the cigarette butts were overwhelmingly the, the, the largest uh, items that we found. I, I will tell you that there were some sites that we went to that we looked and we hunted and we hunted and we looked and we couldn't find cigarette butts. So it's not that they're at every single site, uh, but very much like the water bottles, um, they were at, at the majority of all sites. Um, and something that, that you have to, in some cases, actually look for very closely to find this micro, micro litter, uh, but it is visible once you're actually standing at the sites and looking down at those materials. Um, polystyrene uh, foam containers um, and cups, we tried to differentiate between the two of those based on the way that that material is actually made and then comes apart. Um, the foam container pieces uh, had a tendency to more ball. And so you could tell that that was coming from more likely an ice chest or something that had a thicker, denser container where the cups sometimes were, were pieces or strips. So we could tell those uh, differently. Bottle caps were typically something that was a full size. So we could see those pieces uh, easily. Um, metal beverage cans were sometimes either pieces that had been um, mode. So they were broken up uh, as strips and shreds, but sometimes they were just that tab off the top of a can that we would find a, a fairly a substantial number of those. But we also found a lot of vehicle debris and vehicle debris. We did classify as with the uh, tires in the previous slide for large um, litter that are large items is that that is litter because it's left behind. Um, it's probably, you know, unlikely that someone either intentionally or unintentionally littered vehicle, you know, their, their vehicle debris, but it counts and it has also that observation so that you see it. So uh, the small pieces of plastic that may be left behind or metal from accidents, um, as well as the chips and pieces of, of tire debris. Overall, we found that the interstate roadways had a higher density of litter um, than the U.S. roadways and the state roadways. So this gives you that, that breakdown of how we got to that 143.8 million pieces of litter and where it was located. So um, there are, from a density and average number of pieces, you'll see the interstate has that higher number. Um, with a little over 10,000 pieces uh, within an average mile. Uh, but there are so many more state 
routes, those roadways that are designated as LA within the state of Louisiana, that you will see that the total amount of litter that are on those roadways is much higher. So that's that's the reasoning for the, the, the difference in seeing how those miles equate to then what the total amount of litter is. Uh, where did we find the most litter? It did vary from each of these um, roadway types, uh, but at the point in time that we were out from mid-December to mid-January, mid-December 2020, Two to January 2023. Um, these were the top 10 most littered uh, areas within uh, the state. Um, and frequently at these sites, um, the surveyors noted, uh, you know, unable to take a step without standing on litter, um, that it was prevalent through uh, the entire area. So this is that visible large litter and where we found it um, along, uh, along the, the, the roadways uh, in the state. So you will see from a visual litter perspective, there are some more dense populated uh, areas, but there are also within this some uh, areas that have a lower population or not as high a population area. So density does, population density can make a difference in the volume of litter, but we did find the litter uh, in the urban, suburban, uh, and the rural areas uh, in the state. Um, next is the micro litter and where we found um, the, the highest percentages of micro litter conditions. Um, again, you'll see some similarities to the previous, uh, previous parishes as well that you'll see some, some overlap uh, in where we, where we found uh, those conditions um, with the highest level. So, um, the, the Bossier City site that's number nine on the micro litter site was the number one site in the visible litter site. So where we found large litter, we found the small litter uh, as well, uh, which can be equated both to the standpoint of uh, it being dirty and people will litter all types of things or that the larger litter is being broken down for one reason or another, uh, either for um, you know, just natural breaking down or potentially it's being driven over uh, or it's being mowed. Uh, it could be a lot of different factors on why that is, but you'll see some of these um, that have uh, larger air, larger litter uh, that also had those smaller litters. The East Baton Rouge site is number three. It's the same way that site was um, one of the, the, the higher littered areas uh, was the number 10 area uh, for visible litter. So trends um, and litter across roadways, these were some of the, the, the findings uh, that are included. There is a deeper dive in the reports um, that have uh, some breakdowns in tables that give you a correlation data uh, that talk about the tendencies and differences uh, in the different road types. We did do um, t-test correlation studies. Um, that are also available in the appendix. Um, but from an aggregate litter standpoint, what we found, uh, the interstates had um, the higher volumes. Uh, it had a variety uh, of different types of categories and users. So it, it ranked the highest on this correlation. So not only did we find the highest, the highest amount of litter there based on the studies, but across all of the categories, you saw higher volumes along uh, interstates. Um, tobacco was not limited to any particular roadway. We found it on all different road types, um, frequently at smaller road intersections of a, a U.S. Road, uh, roadways and an L.A. roadway or two L.A. roadways. We found lots of, of, of litter uh, from tobacco products that was potentially tossed out of windows as people stopped at intersections, either signaled or unsignaled stop signs kinds of patterns. Um, beverage containers, similarly, uh, we found those across um, all of the, the road types, the U.S. highways, interstates, and, and L.A. roadways, so a, a predominant litter item. 
um, household items and beverage containers. Interesting, we're a little less um, common along the U.S. highways. Um, no exact reasoning behind kind of what that was, but an interesting fact that we found, uh, we did find um, household items on uh, the LA designated the smaller country roadways at a distance from transfer stations or landfills, um, which might mean that that challenge of carrying trash from one location or the issues about not having um, a, a consistent or regular type of trash pickup at some of those more rural areas um, might have an influence on those household items. Uh, the construction debris we found commonly around interstates. Um, we think that's interstate commerce, you know, people both that are carrying some type of uh, construction type of materials on larger vehicles that are, are you know, crisscrossing through the state as well as those conditions that we found relating to, to prior weather conditions. And as mentioned earlier, the foam containers was something that we found very interesting. <clears throat> as we were documenting at the first few sites, we were thinking it might've been you know, cups or what is this? And it's sort of like, as we began to really go back and investigate, uh, it was very clearly foam containers, foam coolers. Um, I think as the, the Lieutenant Governor mentioned at one of the meetings, it's sort of like quite probably in the back of a boat even uh, that may have flown out um, as people are, are enjoying the great uh, ability to get out in Louisiana and on the waterways, but securing those foam coolers is something that uh, could definitely be targeted to reduce uh, that particular litter. So some other uh, proximity uh, factors that we found um, as well is that um, where there's beautification, um, there's less litter. So adding uh, intentional beautification, anything from mowed grass to actual plantings of trees uh, made a difference uh, because the sites that had no sign of any type of beautification efforts had approximately 38% more litter. Um, so whether uh, it's something that's a planned out landscape or simply that the landscape is cared for, we identified made a, a significant difference in the amount uh, of litter. Um, we found that convenience stores are a location when you're in close proximity to those, there's a higher volume of bags, um, again, which may, may correlate with people buying items, bringing them out uh, of the stores, um, and then that bag either flying away from them unintentionally or that they are gathering their materials, putting it into their vehicle. They try to get it in the right place at a container, but maybe that container at the convenience store isn't closed. So those bags blow, blow out. Um, where there were drainage facilities, so uh, either swales or actually ditches, um, those were places where those beverage containers collected. Uh, they're light, they're floatable. Uh, so uh, there was water, as you can see uh, on the right. In many of the locations, we did have some rainy conditions that influenced some places where the litter was during our survey time period, uh, that that's, those beverage containers uh, collected there. We also found, though, that at sites where there were utilities, uh, utility locations, such as a, a substation, we found higher volumes of containers. Um, we think that may be people pulling off at those spots just to stop because they're, they're kind of open areas with, with, you know, large areas that you might be able to stop temporarily to take a quick break and then throw those uh, containers out. Um, the solid waste facilities for the most place were clean. The areas that were right where those facilities were were clean. Where we found uh, the highest accumulations of, of litter uh, around solid waste facilities is when you went back um, a half a mile or a mile from those sites, you would find higher, uh, higher volumes of, of waste. So the facilities themselves are, are trying to regularly clean and maintain uh, is our uh, theory. Uh, but as people are transporting and getting things closer to that site, that's when litter is actually happening. 
Um, we also found some things in context that I wanted to share. So this is a particular site in New Orleans um, where we actually uh, had a street sweeper out that was uh, at the, the site. Um, we were surveying that area from that pole at, the, at 90 going down the roadway. And the street sweeper made not one, but two passes along the side of the road. So the edge of the road was very clean, but in the middle, as you can see, the area from the edge of the curb actually back and on the other side of this fence has a lot of litter down that. It's an unkept weeded area that's catching litter, but it also is blowing from what's on the right side, uh, which is just outside of our survey area, which included a large dumped area. So where we found heavily littered items on roadways, we sometimes found these larger dump areas on the, the, the far side there. Uh, which did not count in our numbers. We didn't count everything in that far right number, but uh, it's a challenge for us to think about how we go about um, addressing the litter issues while the street sweeper was picking up some of the litter. The issue in this area is much larger to try to deal with. The area is surrounded by convenience stores, uh, fast food uh, locations, is a highly trafficked area. So Important to have street sweepers, but in this one, uh, we need to look at some additional programs and we hope that through the litter studies, people will think about that it's not just what's immediately adjacent to the roadway, but what may be close by as well. And uh, one of the last items in this section I wanna talk about is uh, brands. So this is what the brands were of the items. Uh, if we could identify the brand because it was actually labeled and we could read it or because of the, sh the shape and size uh, of the container, uh, we knew that that was a, a, a product that was packaged in that bottle. Uh, we even went to the efforts in some cases of taking pictures of the litter uh, and ma matching it up with nearby grocery um, or quick service stores to see if there were particularly different brands that could be identified. So uh, within the category of Bud Light, Budweiser, which was by far substantially the largest uh, uh, product brand that we found, about 85% of that top category was Bud Light uh, itself. Um, so of those top items, you'll see they're, they're alcohol related, um, they're soft drinks, the Coke and Diet Coke, again, predominantly the Coca-Cola over the diet, uh, fast food with the McDonald's, uh, and cigarettes, the Marlboros that we could specifically identify uh, Marlboros. Although the water bottles um, were the highest um, with 80%, you know, being found at different locations, a very high level, you'll see that because of the different brands, they're scattered throughout that top branding list. Um, the highest one being um, great value. We thought it would be interesting to match those brands up with who the actual companies are that um, make or package um, those materials. So you can see the matchup on these. Um, Ambev, um, Ambev is um, the bottlers for uh, Bud Light um, and Budweiser and Bush, which were the top um, top three um, on that uh, that list uh, of of packaging. Um, Coca-Cola also includes a number of the water bottles and sports drinks, as does Pepsi, although Pepsi bottles were far down on the list as a particular product, the Aquafina and Gatorade were, were in that top 10 high levels. And Niagara packages uh, three of the highest uh, identified water bottles with um, those great values, Niagara and members marks. We also wanted to note that nearly 42% of all of the visible litter was composed of recyclable packaging. So it was metal packaging, plastic containers, or paper products. So many of the brands that are listed on there uh, do have an active interest in 
increasing the recyclability of their products um, and trying to get their recycling into the markets. Louisiana has a lower recycling rate than some um, of the, the states in the nation. So some potential opportunities for addressing waste reduction uh, and looking at maybe giving that value uh, opportunity for people to recycle versus littering. The next one does a comparison between um, the litter sources identified um, by uh, what we found on the side of the road and the public attitude survey. Uh, we found that motorists are the highest um, within the categories. So uh, in both the public perception as well as what we could actually document and trying to determine where that litter came from was from, uh, from motorists. Uh, the pedestrians, we think, is much smaller uh, in what, what was found through the visible litter survey than what the public perception is because the roadways, the interstates especially, are areas where you would less frequently have a pedestrian uh, individual, someone walking along the side of those, those roadways. Um, uncovered uh, loads is a high percentage um, and was identified as a higher percentage also in the public attitude survey. So here are a few things in targeting the problem. Some of the things that Keep Louisiana Beautiful has already uh, started to work on. Um, I am extraordinarily uh, excited about this because uh, Keep Louisiana Beautiful and the Lieutenant Governor's Office office support of the governor um, have all really said we've got we've got the data we're not waiting we're going forward we're going to address this problem so uh, some of the items like the uh, the uncovered loads are already messaging uh, that has been created and that you can download from the keep Louisiana beautiful so uh, location this site on the left is one that was in close proximity to one of those waste um, transfer stations. And so again, we think that the higher litter density here probably is because people are carrying uh, trash and uncovered loads. Uh, so addressing that is a really key, important piece of targeting the problem uh, to uh, reduce the litter. Uh, partnering to address the problem has also included uh, the addition of a number of grants um, to provide uh, local jurisdictions and parishes with trucks and vans uh, and trailers uh, in order to address the problem. Uh, the picture on the far left is a crew that was actually out when we were doing our survey uh, and we were trying to get ahead of them so that we got what the litter count was before they got there to clean it up because uh, the, the uh, parish uh, did have uh, the crews out doing that work already uh, in support of some of these grants um, to help Louisiana shine. Over $1.1 million in grants is already going out to actually take the survey results um, that have been created and implement these. Uh, the beautification grants we're very excited about uh, as we saw that reduction in litter in and around where you had um, those beautification locations. Um, and the greener grant, greener ground grants also are very important. I'll talk about those in the public perception study um, are helping to address litter at big public events. So we have in each of the sections a series of re additional recommendations that are being used by Keep Louisiana Beautiful and others uh, in the state to uh, address the littering problems. We encourage you to go to the site um, keeplouisianabeautiful.org, uh, read through the report, look at the recommendations and think about what are some of the things that you can do locally either uh, to do on your own uh, in encouraging messaging and beautification um, and or to work with Keep Louisiana Beautiful on helping to create those uh, for statewide implementation. So I'm gonna transition next and highlight some of the results from the public attitude survey. Um, this was a survey uh, that included um, a cross-section of the state of Louisiana. We used uh, U.S. Census data to try to get an accurate sampling. Uh, our goal was 500 uh, Louisians located throughout the state. We actually received 537 um, and estimated a plus or minus margin of error of 4%. So statistically, we think this gives you a, a good representation of what people in the state of Louisiana are thinking. 
uh, very important uh, high numbers related to littering being a problem. Um, a state that has so many waterways, 94% uh, saying that litter contributes to flooding and the high volume and importance of tourism in the state that it is potentially not only negatively impacting uh, tourism, but it also could decrease those related business expenditures to the state. Um, there is a high frequency of people seeing littering. 44% uh, say that they see someone litter uh, either intentionally or unintentionally um, every month. Uh, several times a month, as a matter of fact, um, and a high percentage even seeing weekly, weekly littering. Why do people litter? We asked people to give us their top reasons that they thought that people littered in the state of Louisiana. The top two very close um, were uh, that there wasn't a proper place to dispose of it and laziness. Those were the top, the top reasons. And these were generically no matter where the location was. We did a deeper dive in looking at some specific locations like at festivals and events, but this is uh, looking at generically anywhere in the state that those were the top two reasons is the lack of convenience to dispose of it properly and to think that it was just easier to do it. We asked questions about litter law enforcement to judge uh, what people thought about enforcement. And overall, they were very supportive of the idea that if someone is seen littering, which isn't co necessarily common, but if they are seen littering, that they should be given a ticket. Uh, 60, Almost 68% uh, answered that a ticket should be issued uh, when littering is seen. Um, the smaller numbers, either that uh, they didn't think it would change the behavior or wasn't a good use of the resources were a smaller percentage, um, but uh, represented in the pie chart and the data that you'll find um, also in the report. We asked who they thought should be responsible for issuing that tickets, uh, those tickets. And uh, the highest response was at all agencies. If, a, if anyone within law enforcement sees someone littering, they should be the ones that are responding. So a, a, a thought process, um, I think that's very important that it shouldn't be just left to the local jurisdictions or to state police um, or to the constables. It really should be a statewide effort. A number of these initiatives have already started um, with the Lieutenant Governor's Office and some of the work that Rick Moore is doing to help educate um, sheriffs and law enforcement officers across the state. So again, something that we found are in the research that's already in the implementation stages. Um, we, we were looking uh, for information to assist us about uh, making it easier for people to report litter or why they think people don't litter. Um, we found some interesting statistics and information on this. Um, the, the biggest one was people don't want to get involved. If their name was associated with it, um, they, were, they were less likely to be interested in, in sharing and, and reporting uh, information about littering. Um, you'll also see that, that people thought that uh, it was inconvenient by 12%. And of those that were surveyed, 24% of them said, well, other people don't know how to litter. So that must be the that must be the number one reason why other people don't litter. But when we asked specifically if they knew how to report littering, 68% of the participants said they don't know how to report littering. So we think this may be the bigger issue than necessarily wanting to get involved, is that the reporting process. Uh, is not seen as, as convenient or simply as information that, that is not well known, uh, at least amongst those that we, that we surveyed. So I think we can balance that in looking at the potential of expanding the hotline number within the state or reporting process within the state of Louisiana to think about both how to make it easy um, and informational, uh, and at the same time, give people an option to be able to do it anonymously, um, as well as the opportunity that if they want to get more involved, they can. Cecile, we have a question, if I can stop you right there uh, for you to address. Someone is asking if you could give a brief description of the methodology used for the public opinion survey 
and how were the folks selected and why only 530 people? So this was a this this is a statistical um, surveying process that was that was done. So it's a representative sampling um, of individuals that live in the state of Louisiana. Uh, Forty three questions um, were developed. Uh, they were questions that were created both by Keep Louisiana Beautiful, but we also used questions that had been used in a national study as well as uh, two other three other states. Um, we had a web-based survey approach um, from a standpoint of timing and uh, finances uh, to be able to do this um, that may impact the um, the somewhat the accuracy of the, the survey because you did have to have access to the internet, but uh, looking statistically at ages, ethnicity, um, geographic location throughout the state, we feel that it does give us a statistically accurate representation of um, this, the thoughts and attitudes of Louisianians um, as of 2023. And again, that full report is on our website and you can view it or download it um, and it can provide you with that kind of information. Yes. In fact, all of the questions um, are included in the survey along with the individual responses. Thank you, Cecile. Um, this was one of the deeper dive pieces that we asked questions about um, was related to outdoor events. There are lots of outdoor events, as we know, in the state of Louisiana. Um, and interestingly, this broke down almost evenly across four responses as why do people litter at outdoor events? Um, so you can see uh, someone else will clean up after me. Uh, there's not a trash can that's close by. There's no trash can at all. Or that trash can was overflowing. So one more piece of litter probably doesn't matter. Uh, these were those responses. All of these are something that can be handled through an, a, an organized approach and Keep Louisiana Beautiful has already started that and I'll share um, how they're addressing that um, in a moment. Um, we asked a question to also gauge uh, support within the, 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 those that were surveyed about funding litter programs. So we ask a specific question, if the individual survey would be willing to pay an additional fee on their driver's license renewals that occur every six years, if those funds were directed towards local litter prevention, litter programs, 68% said yes. Um, and of the 68% the that said yes, you'll see that the fee ranged from 50 cents to a high of $2. The those that were willing to pay the $2 were actually almost equal to the 32% that said no to an increased fee. So uh, this, this was information um, that we think uh, it shows again that correlation between that 90 plus percent that see the uh, litter as a problem, an environmental problem. They see it as a problem related to flooding. They see it as a problem related to tourism and economic development within the state and they're willing to provide some additional dollars um, on an ongoing basis uh, for addressing the issue. So those correlations are important to see uh, that connection on this. So this is um, what I was mentioning with the outdoor events, um, the Greener Guide, Greener Grounds uh, Guidebook um, was launched at the Keep Louisiana Beautiful Conference um, earlier this year. It was a collaboration with the French Quarter Festival. Uh, this is a comprehensive guide that helps to address those four key issues. Uh, on why people litter at outdoor events. So helping with checklists to be able to identify, you know, where uh, littering conditions might occur, how litter could be reduced um, through identifying other management techniques 
uh, things that would be less likely to litter. And then to help support that, Keep Louisiana Beautiful is offering uh, event grants. There, as I mentioned with the previous study, some of the other recommendations that were that were made um, included in the survey. Uh, one that we would really encourage local jurisdictions to do is to consider their own public attitude survey, uh, which you could take the questions, modify it down even to a smaller number, uh, and do that at a local level. So you really have a sense for what people are thinking about in your community it will help you address uh, issues long term. And this would be something that could be done at some of those fairs and festivals or at some of the locations in the roadside litter that we identified as challenging locations like fast food restaurants or convenience stores to simply have an opportunity. Or it could be an online survey that might be an in-person type could be an online survey like was done uh, for Keep Louisiana Beautiful. Again, the questions are available and already written uh, and tested. So our final uh, study was the litter cost study. Uh, for the litter cost study, uh, we sent out invitations uh, to cities, parishes, uh, sheriffs, and state agencies asking them uh, to provide detailed data about litter um, and what the costs are. Uh, we were at, we asked questions specifically about um, equipment, about uh, labor, um, about uh, supplies. Uh, we wanted to know if they have any ongoing educational efforts that are funded either by the governmental jurisdiction or in partnership with others where the government is providing those funds. Um, and if the government is supporting volunteer recruitment efforts for cleanups and how those volunteer recruitment efforts, um, what the cost is associated with, with those. We think of them as a being a benefit, but because there's litter on the roadways, that's causing a, a cost as well. So those labor costs included. As you can see uh, from the map, we had representation from across the state um, and uh, we're very appreciative of these state agencies and local governments that participated uh, in providing us the surveys. Uh, with the data that was collected by these local jurisdictions, uh, we did do an estimation of the total cost of litter. So we grouped all of the local jurisdictions to uh, different population groups and then created an estimated dollar amount for jurisdictions within those population sizes, um, added in the state agency costs that we knew specifically, and the total dollars uh, currently being estimated for litter uh, is $91.4 million uh, in the state of Louisiana. So of that 90, 1.4 million, uh, where, is it, where is it being generated from what entities? Um, municipal en entities, large and small, um, are the largest um, contributors, uh, the largest uh, cost factor is to those jurisdictions, uh, followed by parishes. Uh, and the percentage uh, is shown in the pie chart that those two alone make up about 66% of carrying the burden um, of cost of litter within the state. As part of this data research, we did look at uh, four cost categories. So through the surveying, uh, which included uh, direct phone calls. Uh, it included uh, a, a form that could be filled out and returned to us, uh, email, email in, inquiries, um, at least uh, one case of a set down one-on-one -on -one with representatives to gather that information. In the prevention category, we collected information about the maintaining of containers so the containers that were in the parks, the containers that were outside of public buildings, the actual removal of the trash from those public containers that was in the prevention category. 
uh, having events um, either as ongoing drop-offs or specialty events for drop-offs to encourage people to do the right thing through collection events was prevention, as well as providing tools like litter bags or grabbers or things to make it easier. Those all fell within that prevention category. Uh, education included uh, everything from uh, youth education to public awareness. Remediation uh, was the cleanup efforts. So actually sending people out to do the cleaning, to pay a contractor, to have court ordered workers doing that, to have volunteers involved in organizing those volunteers to do events. That was remediation. And then fourth enforcement the other category are there actual are there officers that are doing work or their investigations going on uh, that was the enforcement category when we looked at the breakdown of those overwhelmingly the vast majority of the money is being spent on the cleanup side of things the remediation uh, the going out and and picking the litter up so it's the after it's happened is where most of the money is being spent. This is not unlike you will find in other states, uh, in other jurisdictions, but if we continue to do it this way, we're gonna continue to clean up because we're not addressing the root causes of the problem that we could either through the prevention or education. Especially at the local level, only 2% is being spent on education and outreach. Um, so that is a, an, an area that has an opportunity, some of the work that's already being done by Keep Louisiana Beautiful to expand uh, their youth education efforts, um, as well as some of the public awareness tools that I shared earlier specific to uh, covering loads and the Let It Shine campaign. Uh, by adopting and personalizing that to, to your local jurisdiction, we think we could begin to make a shift uh, in looking from a prevention side and not so much from a remediation side. Um, also from the prevention side, there are those local grants um, that uh, I shared earlier, the 1.1 plus million that can go for beautification, for trash cans, those all fall into that prevention category. So those could again help with the remediation and increased enforcement, which is a, at, a, at a lower level. Um, we know historically that we can't clean up our way. So we need to try to think about how funds are being spent uh, and how we could shift those to a more education and prevention method. One of the things that would make a real significant difference, we think, is a more of an awareness of what this actual cost is. When we contacted local jurisdictions, over 90% of them were like, you want us to give you information on what? We're, it's not tracked. Uh, we say it's a hidden cost. It's something that's built in and isn't readily available. So an important piece that we see from both state government, um, where the Department of Transportation is coding some of their litter expenditures, but how local governments could really make a difference is in reporting and coding that data and tracking it on a regular basis so that people are more aware of what this actual cost is. And if they're aware of the cost, then spending it on the prevention side could really, again, begin to make those changes in litter behavior and developing and promoting that culture of cleanliness. That completes the overview. Uh, additional information, uh, as Susan and I both said, is available in um, the reports, um, which are available at keeplouisianabeautiful.org. And I'll turn it back to Susan uh, if there are any other questions that we can answer. Thank you. Thank you, Cecile. So there are a few questions. Um, this one is um, about the public attitude survey. Um, if your survey is web-based, it presumes internet access, which may be related to income. Have you considered whether bias toward wealthier respondents might influence their willingness to accept an increase on the driver's license fee? 
Um, we did. And actually, we did ask uh, income related questions. So even on the, the this being a web based survey, um, our data did, did show um, a, a an accurate or, or a statistically representative sample from all economic groups within the state. Um, so based on that, we, we feel, you know, comfortable in what the percentages were that were shown in the, the results being a representative sample. Um, to, to get a broader uh, acceptance of that will be, you know, something different, but we do think from a surveying perspective, because we did have um, a cross section of economic groups that were at, at least seeing a, an interest in some level of fee from that 50 cents uh, to a higher amount. Thank you. So we are um, a little bit past our time. So I want to just thank everyone for making time to be with us today. Cecile, thank you very much. Wanted to remind everyone that on our website at keeplouisianabeautiful.org, you'll see these full reports that really break down the whole methodology um, and talk about maybe some of the more, um, more recommendations and how this connects more to the bigger picture. But feel free at any time, my contact information, my email, mm -hmm. uh, as well as Cecile's, you'll see on this slide, reach out to us after if you have any other additional questions, or if you just want to chat about how this information can be used um, in our efforts to prevent uh, litter in Louisiana. Um, so at saying that, I'd like to just, again, thank y'all for being a part of this. And uh, we are here to help and support your efforts throughout the year. So um, thank you for being a part of this and have a good day.